been studying single particle systems for this entire series. And even when we were talking about the hydrogen atom, which ostensibly has two bodies, a proton and an electron orbiting around it, he totally ignored the proton just to talk about the energy levels of the electron, as well as its angular momentum and all that other fun stuff. Can you really call it a two-body system if you only care about one body and assume the other isn't even moving? So, today, we're finally going to address two-body systems. And what kind of makes them a little bit more difficult to deal with in quantum mechanics than in classical mechanics? Now, in classical mechanics, let's say I have two cubes. I will say these cubes are the exact same, but you will say, no, one of them is oriented this way and the other is oriented that way. Or these particles of dust are on cube one and these particles of dust are on cube two. Or cube one is over here and cube two is over there. They are always distinguishable in lots of ways. So these two guys will never be the same. You will never find two classical objects that are exactly the same because that would require them to be in the exact same position and with the exact same orientation and mass and density. And at that point, it's just the, comparing an object to itself. But this is not true in quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics, electrons are fundamentally indistinguishable. There is absolutely no way you can keep track of which is which. You might try to observe their positions to see if anything changes, but nobody knows if your observation implicitly already changed the positions of those two electrons. You might say, record a video to see which ones move. But a video is basically just taking a bunch of pictures very fast. Last problem, you might say, well, I mean, they are in different positions, right? Our experimental equipment shows that we don't even know if an electron has a radius. Yes, we know it has a mass. We know it has a charge. We know it has a classical radius, which is the radius we would get assuming classical electromagnetism. But of course, classical electromagnetism isn't true. And when we tried observing a radius of exactly this size, we didn't see anything. We even made sure that it was the radius was at least less than or equal to 10 to the minus 19, over 10,000 times smaller which means an electron might just be a real point particle. It might not even have a radius. So there's the difficult part. Two electrons can look exactly the same and can change at any moment. So you can no longer call them electron one and electron two. In fact, the only way you can distinguish them is by their spin. They can be up or they can be down. Now, Let's call spin up phi 1 or psi 1 and spin down psi 2. Now, you cannot tell when observing if you have subtly changed the locations or the states of the two particles. You can only say that one of the particles is in psi 1 and another one is in psi 2. You cannot say which is which. So that's very tragic, but we have to move on. One thing that we need to know is... In classical mechanics, usually a system's mechanics depends only on the relative position vector. That is, if we have R1 and R2 over here, the system usually only depends on R over there. Oh, sorry. In quantum mechanics, this is not the case. Also in classical mechanics, you can treat a two-body system as if it's one object with this amount of mass. In quantum mechanics, since we are no longer dealing with mass, this is also not true. Hence, nothing is going our way so far. It looks like quantum mechanics is going to be totally different from classical mechanics. And so, what do we do? Well, to start, this is where the famous Pauli exclusion principle comes from. Why? Well, here's the thing. 
we can only talk about the wave function of this system relatively. So we're going to define a wave function that A contains a note of both the particle states and B is commutative. So if particle 1 somehow switches with particle 2, nothing will change. So there is one way to do this. And there is, of course, the other way to do this. Which means that the wave function is entirely dependent on this existence. Now, of course, you probably already figured out that if psi 1 is equal to psi 2, the wave function collapses. And so both of them can't exist. That is exactly why two particles can't exist with the same quantum state at once. Sorry, two identical particles, and not just particles, fermions, which are particles with half integer spins, cannot exist with the same exact quantum state. That's not allowed. Which means that, well, both this is pretty fascinating, but it's also convenient for us since we get to study the mechanics of the most famous fermions, the ones with exactly half spin, always by assuming that one has spin up and the other has spin down and nothing else. We know that that assumption is going to be correct, which leaves us free to do a lot of nice things. So. This is essentially how we're going to be dealing with two-body and multiple-body systems. We won't be crossing outside the world of half-spin particles in the future. So, next time we're going to be talking about how atoms work. And yes, that's going to include the behavior of the nucleus. So, that means that we are going to finally analyze how both the electron and the proton are going to move around in the hydrogen atom, which is a very difficult ordeal, both because of what we talked about before, Bohr's equation, spin, and all of the other funky things, and also because we now have to account for the proton. And still, while we know that one is spin up and one is spin down, because these two are distinguishable by their charge and their energy, I guess, we actually can't know which one is spin up and spin down, which means that this is not as simple as it seems. So we're going to have to work around this. But how? How will we be able to figure out the dynamics of the hydrogen atom when there are four possible configurations of spin that could be occurring, and you have a bunch of nasty things that, when, that we considered when we were talking about single-body quantum mechanics, plus the issues with Pauli's exclusion principle, and, sorry, plus the issues with Pauli's exclusion principle. And what did I want to say? Plus the uh, issues with Pauli's exclusion principle and the issues with studying two-body mechanics. So what do we do with this? Well, that's something we'll be exploring next time when we talk about the hydrogen atom, for, uh, for the second time, actually. First time, we were just talking about the electron, but now we're going to be talking about both the electron and the proton. So that's it for today. Thanks, everyone. For